Hello, and welcome to our webinar series on the eight professional competencies for preventing drug misuse among college students. I'm Rich Lucy, Senior Prevention Program Manager in the Drug Enforcement Administration's Community Outreach and Prevention Support section. DEA is pleased to be part of this project to highlight the skills necessary for coordinating comprehensive campus efforts to prevent drug use. While we have made significant progress with these issues over recent decades, much more remains to be done. The foundation for this webinar series is a publication prepared by Dr. David Anderson, Professor Emeritus of Education and Human Development at George Mason University. The document was produced with funding from the Mid-America Prevention Technology Transfer Center, which is funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. DEA is pleased to continue its partnership and collaboration with SAMHSA and its Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. Over the course of these eight webinars, we take a deeper dive into each of the core competencies that are designed to promote enhanced professional skills and ultimately affect college students' decisions surrounding drugs and alcohol. This first episode focuses on prevention science, which serves as a natural springboard for kicking off this series. For anyone involved in efforts to prevent alcohol and drug use and misuse among college students, it is absolutely critical to have a firm grasp of prevention science and both its importance and role. This webinar includes, among other things, an understanding of risk factors and ways to reduce their impact and it emphasizes understanding protective factors and ways of developing or enhancing them. We are no longer at a point in time where we can say we don't know what works. We do know what works. We have more than three decades of prevention science to guide us. Furthermore, prevention science is not finite. It continually evolves, which requires those of us working in prevention to continually hone our craft and keep up to date with emerging needs and best practices. I believe this webinar series helps with continuous improvement. It's our hope you and your campus benefit from the information being shared in this webinar. We think you'll find many ways to put the insights and contents to good use. With that, it's my pleasure to turn over today's episode to our host, Dr. David Anderson. Thanks, Rich, for that kind introduction. And Thanks to you and all of your colleagues at the Drug Enforcement Administration for sponsoring this webinar series, but also for all of your good work over the years in working to prevent drug misuse among college students and among all of our citizens. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, and, you know, as you as you've highlighted, our work today and our webinar today and this whole series is based on this resource. This is the resource, the guide to the eight professional competencies for higher education substance misuse prevention. Our aim, although we've made a lot of progress on our college campuses over the years, we have a long ways to go. And so our aim is to enhance a lot of the grounding, the knowledge, the skills, and then the applications around eight core competency areas. We see them as the eight core competency areas. And to do this, I engaged an advisory group of five professionals from throughout the country. These professionals have different areas of expertise, uh, different types of experience, and it was a great group to think through what do these competencies look like? How do we organize them? How do we articulate them? What's actually their content? And we're going to talk about that today. Today, we're doing the first topic. It's prevention science. And who best to do this but Susie Bruce, who serves as the director of the Gordy Center at the University of Virginia. So Susie, welcome. Glad to have you. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Well, it, 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 this is gonna this is gonna be great, and you you have so much to share, and we, we're gonna we have limited time. But can you talk a little bit about your background? I mean, what? Sure. All of us know about your background, but <laughs> but a lot of our viewing audience doesn't know Susie Bruce from the University of Virginia. You know, your your, your long background. Can you talk about that? Certainly. Thanks, David. Um, and it really was just a privilege to be part of the group that helped create this document. Um, it was really 
um, just a wonderful experience to, to be part of it. Um, but a little bit about who I am. Um, I've worked in substance misuse prevention and higher education for 30 years. Um, for the past 20 years, I've directed the Apple Training Institutes um, through grant funding from the National Collegiate Athletics Association. Um, so it's a substance misuse prevention model unique to college athletics. Um, my areas of interest are the social norms approach, uh, peer education, curriculum infusion. Um, I'm a faculty affiliate of Youth Next, um, which is the Center to Promote Effective Youth Development here at UVA. I also serve on the Step Up Bystander Intervention Programs Executive Board, uh, the Responsibility.org Education Advisory Board, and I'm the Virginia representative to the National Consortium of State Coalitions. Um, our office, the Gordy Center, um, has a national mission, so it's not just here at UVA, but um, we work on ending hazing and substance misuse among high school and college students. Um, and we're named after Gordy Bailey, who died in 2004 um, mm -hmm. as a result of alcohol overdose related to fraternity hazing at the University of Colorado Boulder. So that um, having that connection to his family and many others really informs a lot of the work that we do. Yeah, that, that's that's marvelous. And I, I know all of the good work that you've done or much of the good work that you've done uh, and, and, and what's what's interesting and what, with what you just highlighted is your work at the campus level, your work at the state level, and your work at the national level on several different initiatives. So I am very grateful for your involvement with this particular project, because again, again, what, what comes from your background is what we talked about with this whole initiative about professional prevention competencies. And that was about the college environment, the health enhancing environment. And when we put all this together, you know, we talked about these eight core competencies, prevention science, again, our discussion for today, being the first one. So as you think about this overall model and the health enhancing environment, where does prevention science fit? How does it fit? We, we listed it as first. But what's the, well, for you, what's the context? Talk yeah, pre prevention silence really is the core of this work. And that is why it's listed first in the model. Um, if you don't have a background in what works for substance misuse prevention, you'll spend a lot of time spinning your wheels. Um, you run the risk of actually creating harm, which for sure, you know, none of us want to do. So in addition to ensuring your programs and your policies are evidence-based, um, you know, we have an indication that these are going to actually be reducing substance misuse. You know, our campus programs really have to be comprehensive and meet students where they are. So in terms of, you know, their drug alcohol use or misuse or non-use, um, as well as how we craft our messages and our strategies, you know. So for example, the school may have an amazing screening and brief intervention program, but without recovery programs in place for students with substance use disorders or you know, robust counseling resources, then you know, the, the institution really isn't creating that health enhancing environment. If we screen students, we identify them as in need of services, but then we don't also provide the services, we're not actually gonna change that culture. Um, I've taught, um, for many years, a three credit course to our peer educators. And those first few classes always covered behavior change theory. We wanted to give them, um, you know, a framework to guide them before we'd start, you know, diving into how alcohol work and other drugs work on the body or why people mm -hmm. might use substances to feel different. So as a result, then the students were less likely to focus on scare tactics because we know those don't work. And instead they would really start discussing, well, how could I share healthy norms? How would I identify those? What are some harm reduction strategies that would actually work that people would be willing to use? And so, you know, they really would talk about bystander intervention. Um, so this focus on prevention science um, is really applicable to the rest of the campus, you know, not just our prevention specialists. And we wanna help others understand the scientific scaffolding of our prevention work. And hopefully they'll recognize the value and also be supportive and, and contribute and want to join us. You know, I, I like the, those words you just used. The, if, if I heard that right, the scientific scaffolding. 
Can you say a little bit more about, about that? I mean, help, help, help us. Yes, certainly. Um, I think some, you know, some of the strategies we know can be effective, like social norms. Yeah. Um, on face value, folks that don't have this background and haven't seen the research on it might think, well, we don't want to share that most people are drinking. Maybe we want to just share that they just want to focus on who's you know, not drinking. They want to focus on the abstainers, which are certainly a larger percentage of the student population than people might assume. Um, but it just, for some folks, they just don't think why would I share these positive norms? We should just focus on um, don't drink or you shouldn't be drinking if you're not 21. And although we certainly include those messages because you run the risk of maybe being arrested if you're drinking underage, um, we know that when those programs are done correctly and accurately, we can actually reduce um, substance misuse in a population. The other piece of that is maybe people are thinking, oh, this social norm stuff is really easy. I'll just figure out like, what's the normative behavior? What are most people doing? And I'll put that out there. But there's like more nuance because if you don't have a misperception to correct, then you're putting a lot of work in and you're not actually gonna see behavior change. So for example, if you uh, find that a majority of students um, are only drinking, um, you know, like say, 60% of students are, are drinking in a certain way, but the perception is 59% of, they believe 59% of students are drinking in that way. There's no misperception to correct. You're just telling them information they already know. The theory works because people believe people are engaging in more unhealthy behaviors than they actually are, and you wanna correct it. Or maybe they don't think people are using designated drivers. So there's a healthy behavior and they underestimate how many people are actually planning ahead when they go out, what's my safe way home? So that's kind of the both sides. If you think that a strategy just, why would you even use that? That can be a problem, but also if you don't fully understand the theory and the nuances, again, you might be engaging in a whole lot of effort and work and not seeing any benefit. So that's why that pre really knowing prevention strategies knowing the research and not just use this strategy, but why, and all of those nuances makes our work a whole lot more effective. Yeah, that, you know, that's that's so important, having that scientific grounding, because you and I know that theory, but so many others, right. whether they may be new staff members or those that were trying to engage uh, other campus leaders who may not be part of our coalition or our consortium, but mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and that goes back to something you said at the very, very beginning. You know, you said something about if, if we don't do it right, we could create harm. So, right. so there are individuals on our campus who are not intending to create harm, but say something that enables problematic behavior, the risky behavior. And they may not know, if you will, the scientific scaffolding, the scientific right. grounding. Uh, right. Yeah. And, and so as we as we dig into prevention science itself, the question then is, what makes it up? And when we did our advisory group, we came up with these 10 different constructs, the 10 different competencies within prevention science. This is what we said. So the, the trick question, <laughs> the trick, well, maybe not so tricky. But, but do you have a favorite? Is, is there one or two or three of these that jump out? Uh, yes. Oh, um, oh which I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> so, you know, I really, you know, within this strategy, um, engaging students, I mean, that's just, that's why I've stayed in, in higher ed for 30 years in this work, because I just, I love working with students. Um, and that's kind of my go-to whenever I'm feeling stuck. I'm like, oh, we don't have enough student voices here. So that always, um, you know, throughout the whole process of creating this was like, where's the student voice? Where's the student voice? Um, because they're the reason all of us are here. So I would say, you know, as it also flows in with um, motivational interviewing. So again, sort of where's the research? What's the science behind this? Motivational interviewing or MI approaches really focused on meeting people where they are. 
not where we want them to be, but like where are they right now? How can we speak their language? How can we sort of understand their point of view um, and help them identify what's their motivation to change? So that's why, you know, we really focus on peer education, um, including students in all stages of program development, not just like, oh, or at the end, we should have some students look at it because the students are really the experts on their culture. Um, they know how to relate to each other. They know how to reach each other. Um, so we really focus on ways, authentic ways to engage a variety of students. Um, sometimes folks fall in the trap of like, well, I've got peer educators, they're students. You know, they looked at everything, they helped us create it. That's a great place to start because they're clearly invested and they have some knowledge. They hopefully learn the science. Um, so they can identify maybe messages and sort of an overall structure, but those students may or may not know what's really happening regarding hazardous behaviors. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I love bringing in students that are in recovery um, because they do have that sense of like, okay, I know what I was used, I used to do or what my friends who are still part of that culture are doing, um, but that may not always be the case. So you know, some examples of how to get broad student input and engagement in your program development. Um, you know, those can range from a lot of schools have like a, a weekly email that goes out to students. So you could put in like, hey, take this quick survey, like two, three questions, because no one has time. And, you know, maybe you win a prize or maybe you get this thing or maybe it's just answer the survey for us. Um, we've had success with especially if it's coming from a student group, not from my office, if it appears to be peer to peer, students are more willing to fill that survey out. And that's just could be input on what kind of prizes do we want for attending this educational event? Or um, what are the biggest issues in this celebratory drinking um, event? We've also had success with just open calls for volunteers. So we're looking for students to get engaged on this you know, university-wide committee, or, you know, it doesn't even have to be recruitment for your peer education program, but just, hey, I don't know why those students might be interested and they might bring completely different perspectives um, than the students that are kind of the same old, same old, the, the positional leadership. So, you know, the fraternity and sorority members, or maybe there's a student athlete. And so sometimes we get into the, let's just have those positional leaders and maybe they're great, but, I'm always looking for like, who's that, that hidden voice that they really have a personal connection um, and they're just looking for an outlet. And sometimes, you know, those can be the students that this organization or this commitment becomes the defining part of their university experience. So it's, it's helping those students really find their home too. So I guess the last piece on student engagement is I also love working with students who have a judicial sanction for some maybe not the best choices around substance use. So um, it really helps our office. It's very cost-effective and it also gives them a way to, you know, feel like not everybody, you know, that judicial system can often feel adversarial, even if it's not designed to be that way. So having them find a way to contribute, to give back, um, but also maybe just have those more nuanced discussions about substance use that they maybe didn't have through that process. Mm -hmm. um, I guess our last one additional piece on that engagement is in the classroom. So I've really loved uh, curriculum infusion. And an example of that is several years ago, I worked with a faculty member in systems engineering, not exactly the field most prevention folks would think of as a natural partnership for prevention. But systems engineering students, you know, they're learning a lot about data analysis, human systems, um, solving complex problems. We had a student who created a capstone project to learn more about this all day drinking, celebratory drinking event. Um, it was not supported by the university, but tended to draw huge numbers of students every spring. So the student created and administered a student survey. Um, the following year, we had a group of systems engineering students uh, that class analyzed the data and then they presented the results and their interpretation to me. I was their client for this um, activity. But because the entire project was really student-led, which, which really is the key here, the initial student included survey questions to learn when groups ran out of food. Again, this was an all-day event. 
I would not have even thought to ask, you know, list of times, when did you run out of food? But I trusted the student that they knew the culture and they knew that was an issue. So the groups that analyzed the data used their knowledge of this event and the student culture to identify a cause of why students were running out of food so early. That's because our men's groups were providing the liquor and the women's groups were providing the food. And so they were estimating based on the other women that they knew, not the men. So they were running out before the event really even got started. So the students created a solution and said, well, we're gonna create catering guides. We're gonna help people know if you've got 50 people, this is how much fried chicken you need. Um, this is how many biscuits you need. And they put that together. They got it out to all the different kinds of groups that attend. And what do you know, the next year, they didn't run out of food. Um, and over a course of years of building on the student success, we actually began to decrease the alcohol-related problems at the event, right? And so we're all, we're talking about healthy environments. We didn't end the event, but we certainly made it healthier. Um, and that really would not have been possible without real authentic student engagement from beginning to end. Yeah, yeah, you know, again, I like that last word, authentic student engagement, as, as opposed to often just perfunctory or token. Uh, you know, so so what I'm hearing is, you know, have, having students involved to help understand the student culture or mm -hmm. culture, if I may, cultures. Yes, cultures. And they, they help to not just understand, but identify best strategies to move forward. Mm -hmm. They can also be helping to craft the messages. Yes. And they can be some of the doers, whether it is as a peer educator or a facilitator or just a or a messenger. They're, they're, they're helping to deliver. Is that, yeah. is that, is, is that a fair? So, so, yeah. so, so, so a couple of questions about, about students. Do you have, you've worked in this area for decades. What changes do you see, if any, among student engagement over the years and things that might be of interest or that start to wane in interest? Do you see a change or is it generally, you know, you just pick up where you were 15 years ago in terms of a student mindset? I think, um, yeah, I think the things that are constant is everyone wants to have a voice. People want to contribute. They want to have that to be like a real contract, like no one likes busy work. So I don't think that has changed over 30 okay. years. Okay. Um, people want to make real contributions and they want to leave their schools better than when they came in. I think the parts that have changed, um, you know, and some of this is also, you know, with COVID and having losing a lot of institutional or the students losing that institutional knowledge of like, they didn't learn in their first and second years about certain things and then having to re, you know, how do you figure that out? I feel like as administrators, we're doing a little more scaffolding, um, helping the students learn some of these things so that then they can begin that process again. Um, and it's it's how we're reaching students. Clearly, 30 years ago, we didn't have Instagram. We didn't have all of these yeah. um, multiple ways um, of, you know, you put up some flyers and that was kind of it. I mean, students, I mean, students still don't check their email, but they didn't check them 30 years ago either. Um, so I think there's so many things buying for students' attention more so now than in the past. Okay. Um, I think that's one of the challenges, but I, I mean, I find students still want to get engaged. They still, um, they want to contribute. So I think that's, that's what stayed the same, but the way that we reach them is... Yes really yeah. different. And I think because that's changed so much, that speaks even more to the reason we need students engaged in program delivery and certainly the marketing and yeah. where all the different ways, because yeah. Um, yeah, they're the digital natives. You know, they so, grew up with TikTok um, and I did not. So so that, that, that you're getting at this, but here's the other piece is how easy is it to get students involved, whether they're part of a core group or part of you know, your implementers, or just get them involved in attending something or engaging in something. How, how easy is it? Or are you, I mean, can you really reach a lot of different students? Yeah, I think the 
getting them engaged as you know peer educators or um just like people who are who want to like help share this information like i'm still always floored by the students who will just reach out to our office saying i saw our haze film like in a class and was just really struck by that and i want to help like just a cold email um we had a student who you know did that and, and we always say yes we're always like sure i'm happy to talk with you and we'll just see where it goes um people are still touched by alcohol in so many ways whether it's a family member it's a friend and so when students have been impacted and then they realize oh wait there's this place to put all this energy you know i can work with you know the Gordy Center Health Promotion. Um, I think it's us trying to market to them, like, "Hey, we're here," because you may not know that the office is here until you need it, um, or you find a way that you want to contribute. So I think trying to get programs is different, though. I think that has become more challenging because there's so many different ways. And you know, I think students are like, "Just send me a video." Um, and by the way, it needs to be a minute. So it really we need to be a lot more creative than than maybe the way we kind of grew up in this, in this culture, those of us that are a little older, um, you know, it's like, can you make a cool flyer, but that's just not going to cut it anymore. So I mm -hmm. think the, how do we directly meet individuals has gotten more challenging, but I think, you know, that human desire to, you know, make things better. I don't think that's changed. So, so I know that engaging students is really your core. Uh, and again, of these 10, there it is. It's our third one here, engaging students. Any of these others jump out to you, whether it's related to you know student engagement or any of these others particularly jump at you? I mean, you know, our viewers can go and we hope they will go to all of these resources at www.preventioncompetencies.org. Um, but but is there any anything else that particularly jumps out for you? Um, I mean, risk and risk and protective factors, or cultural humility, population approach. I mean, what what else jumps? I'll out? say the cultural humility um, oh, definitely jumps out at me um, because you know again, looking at the science part of if you're doing a value if you're doing assessment. So just sort of what's the lay of land? What are the issues? I think it's really important to look at different student populations and that might be ethnicity. So we know that students who identify as African-American have among our lowest rates of substance misuse. So what are those protective factors? Um, at one point when we were you know, looking at a lot of our data and I was actually directing a survey on a campus, um, we looked at the different subpopulations and then we met with um, those offices um, that were primarily dedicated to serving students in those ethnicities and said, hey, here's this data, sure looks great. What, what does this mean to you? Again, so looking with our allies and our partners, and for example, um, that group said, you know, this is really great. This seems really in line with our experience with our African-American students, but it's also interesting because it's, um, it's, so normative to not drink at all among our students that do have problems it makes it really hard for them to put up their hand and say, hey, I need some help. There's sort of this, this shame and knowing that it's non normative. And so that led to some other discussions. Again, just because we looked at the data and said, we didn't just look at it and say, oh, here's a group we don't need to, to put any services towards. We went with the experts in that community to say, help us understand this data and what does this mean and how can we, what can we do? So we did some training with their um, the peer educators within that group. So they weren't health education sort of peer educators, uh, but sort of like peer mentors. And so we were able to do some education with them, both for themselves that it could be a risk factor, but also to kind of be aware of those early signs within their mentees. Um, so that's something that if we hadn't thought, well, let's really look at subpopulations, that cultural humility to say, I don't know what I don't know. It probably wouldn't have led to that outreach and that um, really some strong partners. So, and that applies to lots of different groups. Um, it could be by ethnicity, it could be um, different Greek populations. Your student athletes definitely have risk and protective factors. 
Um, so knowing who those groups are and sort of, again, meeting all the groups where they are. So for student athletes, they want to know how is alcohol and cannabis impacting their athletic performance? It's like, they're all about athletic performance. Yeah. Um, and so there's still some myths out there about it's not really doing much or it's not a big harm. So when we can really share that um, and have some discussion, again, that can help um, change some behaviors there too. Yeah, and, and as you you know, as you talk about that, you talk about student athletes, you talk about uh, uh, African American students. One of the th elements that we highlight in these ten is apply local data. So we can look at national data, but you talked about on your own campus looking at your own data mm -hmm. and saying, "Help us to understand that," and then how do you apply that? So, so being local is an important message. I mean, yeah, look at national, look at our national data sources, look at national trends, but also what's happening here at our campus at this point in time. Yeah, that because could be it's much more five years ago. Yeah. You know, having your local data is much more salient to your students. Yeah. They might say, well, I don't really care what's happening nationally. I care what happens here because the more distance you can put, the easier it is for students to say, well, that's not my friend group. Yeah, that's not and that's not us. I can I can dismiss this information. And, you know, there's, I think sometimes people look at evaluation and I know there's a whole nother um, slice on, on evaluation, but I don't think it has to be scary. <laughs> um, there's, there's other ways of getting information um, and getting some data right. that right. don't involve a huge evaluation project. Right. Right. Yeah. And we do have a whole separate yeah. module on that. And, 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 and again, data that you can use data that you talked about mm -hmm. that you didn't say data a while ago when you talk about social norms and correcting misperceptions right. and so forth, but that's based on data. Right. It's just local. I mean, it's yes. like 87% of whatever, you know, whatever the numbers. Yeah. And so, we've even, we even had a, a grant funded project um, where we had it by individual chapter. So it was anonymous because that was the only way that um, I think our groups were willing to be honest with us, but they presented the social norms of their fraternity or sorority chapter back to each other and kind of looked at where are we compared to all fraternities and where are we compared to the rest of the university. And that was really a powerful message for them. Right. So you can juxtapose whether it's groups or subgroups. Yeah. Right. To meet your own strategic purpose, which is again strategic planning is a whole different module. So, so thinking about a different question, uh, you've given some illustrations. Are there any other tips or illustrations or examples or case studies um, that you can talk about to yeah. help bring to life any any of these and or 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 prevention science as a whole? Yeah, I, I think I'll go with the whole. Okay. Um, Good. Because to me, it really is about a comprehensive framework. Um, and there's there's always so much work to do and not enough people to do it. Um, so we often will look at like, okay, what's the, you know, what are we doing really well? And then, okay, where are some gaps? Where can we start to like bring partners in? So, you know, it's about being comprehensive, being evidence informed, um, and then like documenting a lot of what you're doing. Um, I think all those are key points and are really central to prevention science, um, but they also link to those other competency areas in the overall framework. So I would say one of the most important things is to use logic models, which is kind of what the problem is, reasons for the harmful behavior, programs that will address attitudes and behaviors, and the expected change. Um, and it gets support, but it also can help you get funding because you've laid out your full argument. And so I have a little example. Um, this okay. is a logic model we created for the step up bystander intervention program. So that's so, a logic model for a specific, a specific, for a specific program, but right. As we were kind of creating it, we're like, well, why are we, why are we creating bystander intervention program? Just because, um, no, <laughs> we had done a survey and we had identified, um, it came out of athletics. So it, um, and this is at the university of Arizona. That was really the, the heart of the home of this, um, and Becky Bell. So. She did a survey. We were one of the institutions um, and we surveyed student athletes to see like, okay, so what's going on? What kind of problems are you seeing? And are you intervening or not? And in both cases, what were the reasons? So then we had some really nice data from three different campuses and went, 
Student athletes are seeing problems and sometimes they intervene and sometimes they don't, but when they don't, gosh, it fits in that theory um, of bystander intervention. So that, you know, came out in the early seventies. We're like, we're seeing the same things today. So if people aren't intervening, you know, to stop negative behaviors, again, going back to that health enhancing environment. So we're seeing unhealthy things in their peers and they're not intervening. And then they're feeling guilty sometimes because they didn't intervene. You know, if we create a program based in, you know, in the science about why people don't intervene and some strategies to help you learn how to overcome those barriers, you know, we're going to increase knowledge. We're going to increase awareness. So we had some social norms piece, pieces in, and then we'll have some skill building. So there's other research that says, if you do all those things, your bystanders are more likely to take positive action the next time. So we'll increase the number of students who intervene. And then we're actually going to create that healthier environment because we'll intervene early instead of when things are at a crisis. Right. So that's just one of the ways. And so we really try to look at that for lots of different topics. So alcohol overdose. We know people don't intervene in alcohol overdose because they're afraid of getting in trouble. So for that, we can look at what are the medical amnesty laws or policies on campus, and then have you educated students on them. But they're also, they're like, I'm not sure it's really that bad. So then you educate them on the signs of an overdose. You make it, so we have something called pubs. So we educate students on that. So that was based on research of what students told us why they weren't intervening. And then again, working with lots of students to create um, you know, an acronym that they could remember that was scientifically accurate, putting it out everywhere, but also reducing that other risk, which was the fear of I'm going to get in trouble. So if you've got a medical amnesty law or a policy, but then you can have those policies, but if nobody knows about it, you might as well not have it. So you have to constantly just saturation of your messaging. So that's kind of, you know, having those strategies, like really, you know, lined up um, also helps you evaluate it. So the second part is how do you evaluate? Um, so what was the problem? What was your assessment? You know, how many people are coming to your programs? And then what's the impact? And can you, in an ideal world, you'll see the impact, what's different between students who went through your program and who didn't. So um, it's it's really important to, to look at those kinds of things. Um, that, that's, that's, that's great. And ju ju just with that thought, you know, doing a logic model, being thoughtful, basing it on best science that's out there, good and good local data. Susie, it sounds like a lot of work. How does <laughs> no, no, and, and so, so yeah. what, what, what can you do? About, what's your tip? What, how do you, how do you get beyond it? That's a lot yeah. of work. That's a big investment. It is. Um, I will say, I mean, I think the hard, the thing that when I, again, when I'm teaching peer educators, they all want to jump five steps and they want to get to the end of like, okay, what color t-shirt are we going to wear? And like, what kind of food are we going to have at this event? And I'm always like, I know you want to do that. And that's the really fun part, but we're going to step back. We're going to take some time to actually put together this logic model. And probably the first time you do it is the hardest, but after that, you're like, okay, I kind of got this and I can sort of, you know, right. switch out some of the different elements based on the topic. But when you really focus on what are my learning outcomes? If it, that was the biggest thing for my students, I'm like, whatever pr presentation you're giving, and that was a class requirement, you need to have three or four and keep it short, three or four learning outcomes that are measurable. Yeah. We're not going to go to the activities. We're going to start with that. And I'm like, the more you do that, the more you practice, the better you get at it. And then your program is going to flow from those learning outcomes because you just go back and you're like, oh, if I want them to learn what a standard serving size of alcohol is, we're going to do bartender school. Well, that makes sense. If I want them to learn, you know, the signs of an overdose, we're going to like show the video about pubs or we're going to play an activity where they learn that and they have to repeat it back to us. So it is more effort up front, but the end result is so much better because you're not, you know, sort of scattershot all over the place. Right. It's, um, it's, 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 it's prevention science. It's prevention it's science. Yeah. 
So it does seem like some work, um, but, and, and I, I'll say, you know, I fall into that trap sometimes too, where we're like, let's start putting the presentation together. And we're like, what's our learning outcomes? Yeah. Start there. And then, and then your evaluation is super easy because you're like, I had three or four learning outcomes. My evaluation is going to tie those questions exactly. And so that makes it so much easier to get everything else done. Once you have those outcomes defined, it's like, don't expect the world, expect this. Yeah. And if you don't get there, you, you try to figure out why. Yeah. And we look at, you know, the stages of change. Um, that's another one of the first things I teach students is look at, you know, if you assume that most of your audience is like pre-contemplation, they, they don't know what the signs of an overdose are. Right. We're like, we are not going to get them all the way to, I will intervene every time. But if we can get them to like pre-contemplation, I mean, if we can go from pre-contemplation to contemplation to say, I'm willing, that seems important to me. I should learn those four signs and yeah. I'd be willing, maybe I'll call. Um, like that's huge. So we also, it, it's helpful to have tight learning outcomes based on who you think your audience is um, because then you have reasonable expectations of where you're going to get in the 45 minutes or an hour that you have. Yeah, yeah. So, so another question is, like our next to the last question is, as you think about key audiences, is there some message you have to a certain audience or audiences or, or certain groups that you'd like to say something special to or, or about? I mean, it could be, you mentioned student athletes, it could be fraternity sorority or the first year students or people in recovery. Is there certain areas of interest that tie into prevention science that you'd like to highlight? Um, you know, I think it's really just about the fact that you need to cultivate relationships. Um, okay. okay, good Sort point. of from anybody. I, I think, you know, my, some of my most memorable projects or relationships have been the ones that were completely unexpected. Um, I think I mentioned before that I, I always try to say yes. So a student is like, hey, I heard about your office. Do you have time to meet? I'm like, sure. Faculty member, sure. And, you know, just to be open to see where it'll go. Um, even if it's just that, you know, initial meeting to learn more about their need, their idea. Um, it really has resulted in amazing partnerships that I, I would not have formed any other way. So I mentioned the systems engineering project. Um, the way that started was the faculty member who had been working with this team of capstone students noticed this one student was really disengaged, not attending meetings, just not hitting all those benchmarks and was like, this is someone, this seems like a change from last year to the fall of their um, senior year. So she happened to talk with uh, one of our student affairs deans who, um, because there was like some alcohol component, it turns out the student had lost a family member mm. um, related to alcohol. Their um, dating partner had been injured at this big celebratory drink, celebratory event um, by someone who'd been drinking. So that student affairs dean said, you should talk to Susie. <laughs> So with that introduction, of course, I'm like, sure, I'll, you know, I'll talk with you. But, and I have to say at first, I was like, oh my gosh, this could be so much work. I do not know what is happening here. This seems huge, huge. But I kind of said, well, let's, let's see where it goes. Um, and it wound up um, with my stronger res reservations at first that that was like a multi-year project. Like we had student groups for years then taking the project and building on it. I mean, they published papers, they were giving conference presentations um, and it really wow. made a positive impact on the student culture. Um, and I, you know, a lasting friendship with this faculty member. Um, I wound up writing a letter of support when she was up for tenure. Um, so I think that's, you know, it's, it's no one group. I think it's also maybe the message is don't exclude any potential partners. Okay. Um, because I thought systems engineering, I don't even, I don't even know what yeah, they what do. What does that have to do? What does that I have know, to do? I know. And I'm like, word? once I, you know, and I really genuinely listened to her because she started off with, you probably think there's no relationship. Let me tell you all the things we do. And I went, oh, there's actually a lot, you know, human systems. Um, listening to her teach her students, like I learned a ton. Um, so it really was this iterative process back and forth with the students, 
with a faculty member, with them running focus groups among their peers, with them partnering with our peer educators. Um, so you just never know when an amazing partner is going to come your way. So even though, yeah, sometimes it seems like it's a lot of work um, when you get the right partner and they are sharing the load, it really can um, just create something really special that wouldn't have happened another way. Yeah. So, so a, a piece a piece of that is you, you you didn't say it this way, but you don't have to do it alone do, or no. do not try to do it alone cultivate relationships, don't close doors. You never know what's going to surprise, I mean, what's going to pop yeah. up. Yeah. I mean, there is, there's way too much work to be done to be stuck in silos. Um, and, 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 yeah. and, and, and you said you used the word early on, think comprehensive, a comprehensive campus program. You know, I mentioned in the opening, we've come a long ways because where were we 30 and 40 years ago? Yeah. We had an awareness week and we had a policy and maybe a brochure i mean that was that's not comprehensive yeah. all of those can be good elements for our effort but it's much much more and that's what the science says that's what prevention science says so so some anything closing that you would like to say something that you wish you would have said uh, any last tidbits you'd like to share with share with us um you know i guess uh you know, speaking maybe to my younger self, I was really, really fortunate that I worked at a really small institution um, and they had um, a federal grant that funded my position. So, um, you know, that's when I talk with students who say, how did you get to do what you're doing now? Um, it taught me a lot about documenting um, because mm -hmm. it's a grant. I think that's a, the, the beautiful thing about a grant, I'm really glad that was one of my first experiences because I've applied those lessons even when I wasn't grant funded, that, you know, kind of anticipate what the folks above you will need. So whether that is, um, you know, making a document of what are our various programs and initiatives, including our policies. So that was one of the things that we were creating. And so we had to document that. that. Um, sometimes it's the bean counting of how many people came, how many presentations did you give, what were the topics, but don't wait for someone to ask for that because they'll ask when there's a crisis and then you're flying around. And the best thing is when someone levels above you says, Hey, do we have this data? And you're like, boom, I have it. And once a year you kind of update it. So it could be here's my annual report of all the things I did and this, the ways, you know, focused on how many students did you get engaged? How many academic departments did you guest lecture with? But also, um, you know, we would create a four page document that looked at, you know, the different prevention populations. So what's universal? What are we doing for all of all students? Programs, policies, ways students are engaged, who are our, you know, who, who do we need a little additional attention to? Who's uh, indicated, you know, what are we doing for recovery? Um, and then we would even list like our major partners, like how, you know, campus police were engaged, how faculty were engaged. Um, and I think, you know, having that, that's whenever I've taken a new job, that's one of the first things I did if it didn't already exist. Um, and it's also a great piece for the biannual review. <laughs> Right, right. So I think it's just those kind of strategies, I think, really helpful to get kind of the lay of the land. If you're new in a position, new to the field, new at that institution, start looking for that and then really asking. Um, you know, at one school, we we actually did a big survey just to see, I and mean, we said to everybody, we learned campus ministers were actually seeing a lot of students and they didn't always know where to refer them. So again, it's if you don't know what you don't know. So we, that was a, an untapped population who were already engaged in the work, but didn't always know exactly um, what our resources were. So then they were on our list. We were always engaged with them, like pushing information out. Yeah. So, so just in, in, in what you were summarizing there, again, the key word here is prevention. Mm -hmm. And if I may summarize what your summary said, you, you, you talked about being proactive. You mm -hmm. talked about being planful, being intentional, thinking comprehensive, but also thinking focused. So, you know, 
this is a societal issue. What is the campus's part in right. addressing it for, for our audience, for, for, for the students today and for their lives tomorrow? And then, and then if I may go back to the, 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 the issue of how overwhelming this can be, just our document, our resource document, our thinking that the six of us put together, we're also on building on the experience that predates us. And so, you know, we pull together resources for, just for prevention science. We have two pages of resources, each with URLs or publication uh, settings. And, and, and that's the case for all eight of the areas. Each of those has those resources in addition to national resources, in addition to data sources that are not local, uh, but they give you ideas. So, so we're not in this alone. We're in this together. So Susie, with that, any final closing, closing, closing comments? No, nope, no more closing, closing. Other okay, than no more talking. It, it, it has been great to be part of this project, and thanks for inviting me to uh, sort of share some of my thoughts. Um, well, you've been marvelous. You, you, you're a major contributor. You always have been, and I know you always will be. So just just in in, in closing, I thank you, Susie, for for really bringing this to life. Prevention science sounds maybe a little stiff, not as stiff as evaluation, but it sounds a little stiff and maybe a little scary to folks. And I thought, I think what you've done is help say, this is important, this is vital. Without this, you know, we're just kind of blown in the wind. But yeah, you've really brought prevention science. You've shown a light on this. I, I also wanna thank uh, the Mid-America PTTC for their initial funding to help create this document. I thank Rich Lucy and his colleagues at the Drug Enforcement Administration for all of their good work and particularly for sponsoring this webinar series. And now I thank each of you who is viewing this, listening to this and thinking about moving forward, using these resources to move things forward, building on these eight aspirational ideal competencies to help make our campuses healthier and safer for our students today and our students tomorrow. So thank you very much. Thanks.